Um, welcome to our Better Way Thursdays. Today is Recruiting 101. Um, I am covering for Robin today, who couldn't be here, but I'm thrilled that I get to announce um, Amanda and Betty here, who are going to talk to us all about recruiting. So they're going to talk some about um, what it's like to be a recruiter, like as a job, what you do, what, you know, what does that entail? Um, but then they get to talk to us about the other side as well, about what a recruiter is looking for. So we get kind of a double bang for our buck with this one. So um, I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves. And if you have any questions, of course, put them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get to them. Amanda, do you want to start? Awesome. Yeah, sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just because I do have some slides for us to go ahead and introduce ourselves in. Um, so yeah, well, hello everyone. First and foremost, um, like Mikkel was saying, um, this talk is going to be hopefully pretty comprehensive. Um, hopefully give enough information for people who already have dealt with recruiters, but also some people who might not have dealt with recruiters or even may not even know what recruiting is like. Um, so yeah, I kind of considered it a recruiting 101 course. Um, to introduce myself first, um, my name is Amanda, and I am currently a senior technical recruiter at Twello, which is a small startup tech com company out here in Utah. Um, but we are actually a remote company, so our workforce is all over the U.S. Um, I just recently joined Twello back in August. I was previously working for a really long time as a technical recruiter at Tesla, so um, have some pretty good insights. Um, but we also have Betty on the call. If Betty, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Amanda. I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm a talent acquisition manager at Dwello as well. Um, and I previously worked with Amanda at Tesla, um, both in a high volume capacity corporate side of the world as well as the technical side. Um, and prior to that, I was at Vivint Smart Home um, recruiting for a sales department. Awesome. Yeah, so Betty will be chiming in just to give some other perspectives as well. but. But yeah, first and foremost, I thought it would be a good place to start just to explain what recruiting is, where does it lie in the organization, and, and what are some of the different roles that fall within the umbrella of recruiting. So recruiting itself, the team can fall within, uh, it can operate in a couple different ways. So depending on the company itself, recruiting as a team is either a part of HR's responsibilities. So as well as like employee concerns and payroll benefits, HR might also do recruiting. Um, but at other companies, it is its own separate team within people operations. So recruiting would be one function and then HR would be another, um, but they would all fall within the people operations umbrella. Um, tech companies, especially though, often have their own dedicated recruiting teams. So very important to kind of differentiate that, that not all recruiters know about HR. <laughs> um, but because they are part of this people operations umbrella, the main priority of recruiters is to find and hire talent. Um, but again, people, they also do a lot of the work with onboarding, they really care about retention as well. And of course, workplace satisfaction, because those are all things that will greatly impact the recruiter's job, right? You know, if people aren't happy in the company that they work and they leave, that means recruiters are going to have to hire more people. Um, so even if the main portion is kind of finding people and bringing them to their start date, there is still that overlap between the other focuses. From there, we also have a couple different types of positions that are within the recruiting team themselves. Um, I also wanted to highlight this in particular in case anyone is ever interested in potentially going into recruiting as a, a career change. Um, so highlighting some of the different positions that are great uh, entry level ways to start off. Um, so we have coordinators, sourcers, and recruiters starting off with the coordination side in particular. This especially is a, a great entry level role within the team. Um, this is somebody who's a bit more on the administrative side. They work as a support to sourcers and recruiters. Um, and one of the biggest things that they focus on is helping schedule interviews. Um, obviously, recruiters are working with a lot of different candidates. They're also having to work with a lot of internal staff stakeholders. So sometimes it can be a, a little bit much for us to also be having to schedule all the interviews, you know, sending out confirmations, keeping track of so many people's calendars. So that's where the coordinators really come in and make our jobs a, a lot easier because they kind of take on that function. Um, I, like I said, they also send the confirmation emails. So if there are any issues with scheduling or rescheduling, they help take care of that. Um, but they also can take care of some of the other administrative support, like uh, keeping 
track of notes, um, helping us track overall data and metrics, um, helping us manage documentation. So really a vital aspect and a great way to learn about all of the ins and outs of the recruiting world. From there, we also have sourcers, where this is actually how I started my recruiting career. I was an associate sourcer for my first position. Um, so this is a really great way to, I think, get a little bit more hands-on with recruiting, especially because a sourcer's main job is to proactively reach out to candidates. So if you've ever been reached out to on a job board like LinkedIn or Indeed, this is really where sourcers <laughs> lie. Um, so they come in and they, they do searches. And so they get to know the teams, they get to know the positions that are open. They're often working more specifically on roles that are high priority, um, maybe because it's just a really niche role and they need very specific skills that are hard to find, or maybe on the flip side, because it's a high volume role where they need to just hire a ton of people. Sourcers are great resources for those types of positions because they can go into those, those boards and find people that are great fits. Um, so yeah, a lot of the people that sourcers reach out to are not actively looking. And so there's a little bit of that having to, you know, reach out, convince people, you know, Hey, are you interested in learning more about this opportunity? Um, but it's a really great way to, to in depth, get to know, okay, how do I find somebody with this skill? How do I navigate the different requirements in terms of years of experience versus location versus the skill set? Um, so really great place and a great skill that I think all recruiters can really benefit from. And then finally, there's the recruiters themselves. Um, and I, I have some of the requirements and some of the main aspects of the job that the recruiters do here. But um, since that's the main portion of this presentation today, I'll go into it a lot more depth in this slide. Um, so recruiters are really the main owner and the main point of contact for the project and the team. So they, this is the person that from the very beginning, as soon as a, a hiring panel or a team decides that they want to open up his position, they work with the recruiter to get that going. So this is including setting up regular syncs with the team, going through what we like to call role intake. So all of the specifics in terms of what is this job going to do? Who's the ideal person we're looking to fit that job? So really the kickoff for this, for this, uh, this role. Um, they are also the person who's tracking the pipeline, you know, keeping, keeping track of, you know, how many applicants are we getting? Are we getting a lot of visibility with this role? Do we need to get sourcing support. Um, they also share all of this data with the team as well. Um, and then, of course, they help move candidates through the process itself. So uh, going in more depth with each one of those, those points, the role intake itself, itself is what helps with the job posting, but it also helps give recruiters a lot of information to help answer questions that candidates might have when they're talking to them. Um, so things like what are needed skills versus preferred skills and nice to haves. Um, again, how many ideal years of experience are we looking for here? Um, this is also where a lot of the work happens in terms of leveling. So are we looking for a, a junior? junior or mid-level or senior, um, as well as the related compensation bands. Um, we also like to talk through things like what are the growth opportunities with a position like this, as well as what's going to make somebody excited to work in this role versus the immediate challenges that they might face. Um, so once you have all that information, it makes it a lot easier to create the job description, get it posted. And then from there, it's also really important to determine the interview process specifically. So from the get-go, what is the process that we're going to bring every candidate through for that equity piece, um, but then also determining how many steps they're in that process. So we can also communicate that with candidates. Once all of that is set up, the next part is to, of course, find the candidates and start getting them through that interview process. So recruiters will use uh, ATSs, which is applicant tracking systems. Um, they'll also use job boards, like I mentioned before, things like LinkedIn, Indeed, Monster, ZipRecruiter. Um, for some of the technical roles I work on, I also like to use sources like GitHub, where people are coding together. Um, so we use all of these avenues as ways to find potential candidates. And once we find those candidates, and especially Especially finding the interested ones, we set up phone screens with them to help confirm the details of the position and make sure that people are going to be a good fit.
Um, like I mentioned before, this is also the point in the process where collaborating with other recruiting team members like coordinators really come into play. Um, but yeah, really recruiters, they're working with so many different people, right? The candidates themselves, carrying them through, navigating and updating uh, with the team as well, um, as well as working with some of those other coordinators and sourcers as well. But the last thing I wanted to talk about just in terms of explaining what recruiters do is just kind of highlighting some of the success attributes that uh, I think a good recruiter has. Um, so especially, I feel like a lot of people will end up talking to recruiters at some point in their career. Um, and I think that you can really tell the difference between somebody who's really passionate about their job as a recruiter versus somebody who kind of just does it as a job. Um, so successful recruiters are often really timely. They care about getting you feedback in a quick turn turnaround time, and they want to be able to carry you through the process in a quick turnaround time as well. They also really deeply care about the candidate's experience. So they have a good understanding that even if we don't hire somebody, uh, they're still a potential customer. They're still somebody who can be able to give us good word of mouth and maybe help give us a referral of somebody else who might be interested in working with us. They're also able to generate talent from a number of avenues. So they don't just rely on applicants coming in. They are willing to go to things like conferences and, and career fairs and network and be able to try to think of other ways to get people just to even learn about the company and the brand in the first place. Uh, they're also able to provide feedback in a really clear, concise, but also empathetic way. You know, obviously getting feedback in any environment can be kind of difficult, but I think getting feedback as a candidate is always important so that you know how to improve. So being able to, to give that feedback in a, in a careful way is really important. Um, hand in hand with that is also transparency. So being upfront with you, if something's going on pause, or if the managers need more time to think, you know, just being willing to give you the update of, Hey, here's exactly what's going on in the process. Um, internally, I think it's also important for recruiters to really understand that they're the owner of that project. So that accountability aspect and being able to own their mistakes as well. You know, everyone makes mistakes and those are all growing opportunities. So being able to take that and, and run with it, right? You know, make the changes that you need to be better. They're also really able to multitask and prioritize tasks. Um, often recruiters are working on more than just one position. Um, so for example, I have five different roles right now that are on my, my bandwidth. Um, so really being able to understand, okay, well, which is the most important role that I need to maybe spend a bit more of my time on versus an, maybe another role that's not as high as a priority, but maybe is a bit more difficult, a bit more niche. Um, so those are all important considerations. Um, like I mentioned before, collaboration is so important. So definitely need to be able to work well with others, um, but also need to be able to adapt to situations. It's not uncommon for the teams that you're working with to change what they're looking for, or maybe change um, the, the specific details of the role mid process, you know, as they start to talk to people realizing that they need different types of skills. So being able to, to kind of keep with the pace is an, also an important uh, attribute. And then the final piece is like loving what they do. I think that when you talk to somebody, you can really hear when they're passionate and when they believe in the, in the work that they're doing. So that's something else I also like to call out if you, if you are talking to recruiters. But yeah, so that kind of covers recruiting, you know, a brief overview of what we do and the roles. Um, the next part to jump into is the interview process. Before I do, are there any questions? Um, yes. So if someone was looking to become an entry level recruiter, one of those, uh, you know, source or coordinator roles, what is, is that the title you would look for on a job application, like sourcer coordinator, or like what are the, the keywords that someone might look for um, if they were interested in an entry level role? Yeah, so I definitely say recruiting coordinator is a great one. Um, you can also look for a recruiting sourcer or just sourcer. You'll also see some recruiting jobs be labeled as talent acquisition. So anything related to talent acquisition can be really relevant. Um, Betty, those are the main ones coming to my mind. Do you have any other thoughts there? Yeah, um, headhunting can be another one. That's a little bit more niche, but I think traditionally you'll see recruiting coordinator um, technical sourcer or like associate recruiter. A lot of the time you can see that being used in place of a traditional sourcer as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then also, so kind of from a technical recruiter perspective, um, how much technical knowledge do you have to have and how does that come into play? And what, what is the interplay there of what, what background do you need to have in, in tech to be a tech recruiter? 
That's a great question. So I guess to answer the question, I'll just give you a bit of a background on myself a little bit deeper. I do not have technical background. I um, started off as just a general sourcer. So the team that I initially joined, and this is a little bit unique, not all companies have this, but we were kind of like the firefighting sourcer team where whenever there was a high priority position or just a recruiter within any part of the business that needed help, they would use our team as an extra resource. So we were kind of a plug and play sourcing team. And so that was really great. Um, we started off specifically supporting sales and service teams. So I started on a completely different side of the business. Um, but as we started gaining traction and I, I learned a lot about sales and service positions, we actually started getting other teams to ask us for help as well. So that's when I started getting to work on roles like, um, analyst positions. I also worked on some design and marketing roles. So we started to touch other parts of the business. Um, but it wasn't until I had been working as a sourcer for about three years that I actually started supporting engineering roles. And I was very fortunate to be able to help with the university engineering hiring first, which was a great kind of way to ramp up and get a better understanding of the technical requirements. And then from there, I moved into full cycle technical recruiting. So the, the overall answer is you don't need to have that background. Um, you can definitely be ramped in it as long as you're really you know, willing to ask those questions. And that, that goes in both, both fields, right? So asking questions to your hiring managers to get a better understanding of, okay, what exactly is it that your team does? Um, explain to me specifically how you do that. What are the important tools? And then also being willing to ask candidates on the phone, hey, you mentioned this technology or hey, you mentioned this. I've not heard this before. Can you explain it to me? Um, and that's one of the things I'll talk about here in a second in the interview process as well is, um, as a recruiter, when I'm screening somebody, I do look for them to be able to describe things in layman's terms, because it's a great way to see, you know, it, it's a great way to test how deeply somebody understands their craft. If they can explain it in a way that even somebody who isn't an engineer and doesn't code can still understand it. Awesome. Great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're good for now. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I, I bet this will be the part that has more questions too. Um, okay. Perfect. Well, to go ahead and get into it. So this presentation, again, for the interview process, it's a little bit more geared towards um, technical roles. I mean, I hire mostly for engineering, QA, data, and occasionally some product management type positions. So occasionally, um, Betty will jump in and give some perspective for more corporate roles in, in technical companies. Um, but yeah, this, this uh, process itself is much more geared to those more technical positions. But here are the four steps that you'll often see, and this is very generalized. Um, the interview process itself can really depend on the company that you're interviewing with. But I would say that in my experience, this is kind of the standard that you'll see. So you'll first see a recruiter screen, a little bit more of a casual conversation. From there, you'll talk to a hiring manager. If that conversation goes well, you'd then be asked to complete some type of technical interview, whether that's a live technical coding question or a take-home question. And then if everything looks good with the code, then we would move to a final round interview, which is often like a virtual onsite and you'd be meeting with many different people. So it's a panel interview, um, but to dive into each one more specifically. So the recruiter screen, this is uh, the point of the process where it's much more detail oriented. So really, again, I don't have a technical background. So what I'm focusing more so is in, if the details of the job and the culture of the company is going to be a good fit for the candidate. So I like to ask questions on things like, how much do you know about the company that we're talking about today? You know, why are you looking for new opportunities? Where are you in your process? You know, getting an idea of their timeline. Um, I also like to kind of put a little bit of it in the candidate's per perspective and their hands. So having them walk me through their background, and then that's where I get a sense of what are the specific things I want to ask more questions about. Um, but especially for engineering roles, I also have them specifically highlight which languages and technologies they're most comfortable with. Um, oftentimes, if a job description specifically lists a technology or a language, and that's a very good call out that they are looking specifically for people who are comfortable coding with that. Um, and then I also like to ask them for what they're looking for in the next position. So this, this part has two 
two parts to it. What are they looking for specifically for their next move in their career? So what type of projects do they specifically want to work on? Are they looking to stay in the same area that they're in now, or are they open to different types of opportunities? Um, but I also am looking for what they're looking for in the next work environment. So what does a good leader look like to you? Um, how do you like to learn and where do you learn some of the things? Because obviously tech is an ever evolving and there's always new, a new information, new devices, new new tools coming out. So how do you kind of keep up to date with that? Um, and then finally, I always like to ask the candidate to walk me through a challenging project that they've worked on. And I leave it pretty open ended in terms of what was challenging about it. But I like to just hear a little bit. This is kind of where I was talking about the, the layman's terms, right? So as problems come up, how do they problem solve through it? What are their specific roles in dealing with those problems? So that especially this is a great chance to get an idea of their collaboration style. Like, are they very independent? Do they like to just take it on by themselves or do they go and they work with a team and have other people they brainstorm and bounce ideas off of? Um, so this is where there's a lot more in-depth questions that will come out of it. You know, as they're walking me through it, I'll ask clarifying questions like what was your specific role in solving that problem? How long did it take you? Um, looking back, was there anything you would have done differently? Um, and again, you know, how and where did you learn that? Um, so those are kind of the overall questions. Again, this is also the details perspective. So I'll also end the call with uh, talking a little bit more specifically about details like compensation and benefits, uh, again, their interview timeline. Um, as we go through the process, I'm also going to be the person who's trying to get an idea of like their requirements with things like time off, or if they're going to have any PTO for their upcoming start date. So that was one of the big things I wanted to call out in terms of tips, in terms of preparing for a recruiter screen, um, is that we are definitely the best person to talk about with those specific details. The things that are going to really make or break are if this position is going to actually work for you in a day-to-day -day perspective. Um, I also would say one of my other big big tips is to prepare examples. Um, so I highlighted in there, there's the STAR method. Um, a really great way to prepare for any type of interview is to create and think through a couple different examples of projects that you've worked on or situations that you've been in. And you want to try to make sure that these examples are really related to the skills or the requirements listed in the job description. But you want to try to think of examples where you can clearly walk through the situation itself the task that you had in it, the action that was taken, and then the overall result. And having those, those examples prepared in advance is just going to make you feel a lot more confident and a lot more prepared, but it's also going to help you not get sidetracked and not get off on tangents as much. So that's a really big piece of advice. Um, and then my final piece of advice, especially in this early stage of the process, is definitely update your resume to highlight the skills that match the job description. Um, obviously, recruiters are looking through a lot of resumes on a day-to-day -day basis. So we are really looking for some of those keywords and those, those clear highlights that are relevant to the job description that we have posted. Um, so I know it's a little bit tedious to do that, but definitely is a good idea to update your resume for each job you apply to. Um, Betty, do you have any other call outs here that you'd like to mention? Yeah. So talking a little bit more towards the, the corporate side of the business, you'll see this format pretty much throughout most companies where, um, you know, you have the recruiter screen and then you move on to the other steps, but specifically within the recruiter screen, uh, what we're looking for is like your logical progression in your communication. So a big component is not just what you're saying, but how you're logically working through that method of communication. Um, so going back to the STAR method, like really what that method does is help you actually answer the question. Um, a lot of complaints or a lot of reasoning why people could get rejected at the recruiter screen level and potentially at the hiring manager level is that they're not accurately answering the question or they're dodging it. Um, I think from our end, we'd much rather see someone own the fact that they might not know something or that they don't have direct experience with the questions they're asking. Um, so just, just a quick call out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. 
Awesome. Well then, so yeah, if that conversation goes well and, you know, we want to move somebody forward in the process then the next step is going to be a hiring managing manager screen. So um, this can really depend again on the, co the company itself in terms of how long it can last. But I would say it's typically at least 30 minutes, if not an hour long. Um, this could be done over a phone call, a video conference. And in some cases it might even be set up in a coding room so you can code live with the interviewer. Um, but the technical roles, it's going to be a little bit of background. So they're also, the manager will want to take some time to understand potential team fit and again, collaboration style, but there's also usually a certain amount of technical questions. So kind of getting the, the hiring manager will want to get a better understanding of how much this person actually knows. Um, and especially in terms of methodologies and approaches, um, how do they kind of think through those things? And, um, Again, the questions that themselves will really depend on the role that they're interviewing for. So if we're looking for a front end coder, then we would ask them specific questions on like JavaScript or React, or how did you decide to, to use React versus Angular? And where are you learning that? Um, there might also be questions for like a backend engineer in C++ or Python. So it really depends on the position specifically. Um, but if there is that coding, the coding portion that I'm mentioning here, then just really be expecting that to be whatever is called for in the job description. So this is another good call out of like, maybe you're are not the strongest in this, but there is that opportunity to still kind of research a little bit and at least get a, brushed up with some of these skills before you even go into that hiring manager screen. Um, and so some of the tips there kind of go back to what we were just talking about with the recruiter screen. Um, again, you'll see the star method is mentioned on here. Uh, again, wanting to be really relevant and concise to the questions that they're asking. Um, kind of like Betty mentioned, a lot of the feedback that I get with hiring manager screens is that they are really getting off topic and kind of dancing around the question rather than just directly answering it, it, it itself. Um, so one of the other big call in that regard is to ask questions. Um, this kind of has a number of different reasons why it's so important. First and foremost, it's a good call out that if you don't know something, it's another example of a way to say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to admit what I don't know and what I need to improve. Um, but it's also a really great way to show how passionate you actually are about getting this position. Like asking the managers questions about, you know, what does the roadmap look like? What is kind of a short-term project versus a long-term project that I might be expected to work on if I got hired? Um, what does the team like to do for fun? Like really asking those questions that are going to give you a better sense of what it would actually be like to work with this person. Um, because again, it, this, this screen is usually going to be with the hiring manager. So the person that you're going to report directly into. So it's definitely a two-way street of communication. And it's a great way for you to get more of a better sense of what it's like to work there, as well as the hiring manager to get a sense of what it would be like to work with you. Um, and then hand in hand with that is the doing your research. Um, by this point in the process, if you're talking to the hiring manager, you should really be excited about the opportunity and you should really know your stuff about the company. Um, so even if there's like limited information and limited uh amounts of knowledge that you can find online or doing research. Um, it's still better to show that you've tried to do that research. And again, a great opportunity to ask questions to fill in the gaps that you don't know. Um, but again, great opportunity to show that you're really excited. Yeah, any other call outs there, Betty? Yeah, I absolutely love that, right? Because the one thing that you can't train on or develop somebody on is interest. That's like the bare minimum that needs to be there. All hiring managers and all recruiters are going to be looking for that. Um, another call out on the hiring manager screen and the recruiter screen on the corporate side, there's obviously varying levels of seniority, right? There's like more entry level associate, and then it goes all the way up to like senior directors and managers. Um, as you're more on the junior side, um, it's really important to demonstrate your your basic abilities, like the ability to communicate, get your foot in the door, willingness to learn. Whereas when you get higher up in that ladder, it's a combination of obviously those like admirable attributes, but also being able to demonstrate and communicate your actual projects that would impact the business. And you can get a lot of that information from the job description as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say that's a great call out, especially for entry level positions is that hunger, that curiosity where it's like, hey, you don't need to know everything, but you should at least be really, really hungry to learn it, you know? So yeah, I, I think that's a great call out. Um, well, perfect. Any questions before we move into the next point? 
Um, yes, we do have a few questions. Yeah. Um, one, I have a self-serving question. I, my background is a software developer. Um, and I'm curious what the lay of the land is these days in recruiting as far as like whiteboarding goes. Is that still general practice? Is there, has that evolved in any way? It was certainly the dreaded thing when I was, you know, interviewing all those years ago. Um, what, what's that process like? I would say with whiteboarding, if you're going to see it, it's probably most likely going to be in the final round interview. Um, That's where you're more often going to have, um, especially since we're not doing in-person interviews nearly as much anymore (laughs) since the, since the pandemic, Um, you will have virtual opportunities to do that. So with like a coder pad room, for example, going into this environment where you can code live with whoever's interviewing you. Um, So yeah, final round is definitely where I've seen that more so of like, okay, here's a general question. And we want to get a sense of how you would start to approach that. And they're open. I mean, again, they're open to questions. They want to collaborate with you. They want to brainstorm with you. So yeah, whiteboarding is very common at that point. But earlier in the process, I would say it's much more of like a standard question, a little bit more cut and dry. Okay. I like what you're saying though, even about live coding is better on a computer than on a whiteboard. I mean, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with what whiteboarding is, it's really where they like put a code challenge on the board and like say, solve this on the whiteboard. And, you know, as a software developer, the reason we hate that is because that is not real world coding. No one codes like that. That's not, it's not a very, it's very kind of outside your, uh, you know, normal workflow. And so hearing that, like, they're doing it more in kind of a, like a live coding session, like on a computer or something like that, that, that uh, sounds like it's evolved since my day. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question is, um, are there some general kind of red flags that you guys see when in the, in these kind of phases of the, of the recruiting process? Yeah. So I think that the asking questions, like that's specifically one that I, I called it out because I, I considered it a bit of a red flag when people don't have any questions at all. Um, to be fair, I try to be really thorough when I give information to people. Like I have a lot of points that I'm trying to share, um, but people should still have some questions, whether it's about, again, like day-to-day like details, or if it is more about like, okay, well, what is it like to work here? Kind of more general things. So that is definitely one of the reasons why I called that out. It's a little bit of a red flag. Um, I'd also say, again, same reason why I called it out is kind of the hunger and that curiosity. Like at least for me as a recruiter, I am looking for people to be humble. You know, there's, I think sometimes engineering can be a little bit difficult because obviously you're proud of the work that you do, but you, we also aren't looking for people who are super arrogant. Um, there's always something to learn. And a lot of the companies that I've worked with, like Tesla and Duello, both are really big on continuous learning mentalities. Um, so we want people to be able to say like, Hey, I'm willing to learn this new skill. I'm willing to, to work with somebody else. I'm even willing to help teach the things that I know to other people. So continuous learning definitely has the two parts of it, right. Of learning, but also teaching. Um, so yeah, those are definitely some big call outs for sure. Where if somebody seems really closed off, you know, maybe they, they just seem like they're taking a lot of credit for the things where it's like, naturally, these are team efforts. You know, those are some red flags for me, um, as well as, just kind of assuming that they have the position, like getting ahead of themselves a little bit. I have had calls like that where people just are like, oh, okay, this is great. Like, let's move forward to the next round. And I'm like, oh, well, hold on a second. Let's back up here. Let's, let's ask some questions for you. Um, so those are the kind of ones that come up top of mind. Betty, do you have any other call outs? Yeah, I, I have some really obvious ones that come up sometimes. I think maybe more on the corporate side, but there are some really obviously like don'ts, right? Like I wouldn't lead the conversation with asking about compensation, for example, right? Like let that be at the end. Um, Another one would be like not knowing who you're talking to or not knowing the company you're interviewing for. Um, I know if you're job searching, sometimes it could get jumbled up, but that's like the one biggest turnoff for recruiters is if you don't know who you're talking to and you don't know the company you're talking with. Um, I think that's a huge one. So just do a little bit of preparation beforehand and, and know who you're talking to and, and have that excitement, like Amanda said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even just five or 10 minutes before you're getting on a call with anybody, just to like refresh yourself on, on who, again, who you're talking to, but also the company and like what they do. Um, it, it can go a long way for sure. <laughs> so that's a great call out. Awesome. Um, another one that I have is, um, what percentage of the kind of job listing that you put out there, should someone, you know, fill those roles? Like, you know, we, we tell the women, they don't have to feel like they don't have to check hundred percent of those boxes. So from the recruiting perspective, what would you like, what percentage would you say is like a fair kind of amount to, 
to feel like you can apply for that job realistically? Well, I think it can depend a little bit on the level of the job that you're applying for. Like, you know, if somebody's a senior and we're looking to fill a more experience level position, I think you're starting to get higher up there of like, we are expecting for more, more of these to be filled, especially like, you know, once you start to getting up to like a manager level, we're really expecting this person to be able to, to come in running and be able to do a lot of these things right off the bat, um, right off the bat, I should say. Um, but for an entry level role, I feel like there's more flexibility with that. Um, I would kind of, you know, roughly say anywhere between 50 to 75% um, is kind of like a good sweet spot where it's like, you should at least be able to accomplish several of the bullet points. But if there's a couple things where you're like, Hey, I don't know this, but I really would love to do that. Then I think that's still, that's still really relevant. Okay. Would you agree, Betty? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say actually, um, I would say closer to 50. I found myself finding people with the right mindset really override some of those hard skills. Cause I think, you know, the right company will a hundred percent teach you how to use Salesforce. If you don't know how to use Salesforce, if you demonstrate the aptitude to communicate your willingness to learn um, and just your overall like excitement and fit for the role um, mm-hmm. as a whole. So I'd say it starts more big picture and then it gets smaller, more granular. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Definitely agree with that. Yeah, I definitely, I I would also add just to add on to that, you know, if you can demonstrate from a different example where it's like, Hey, even though I don't have this specific skill, I have this experience of learning this other's program from the ground up because I took the initiative to learn it on my own time. And I did a personal project in it. You know, even if it's not the same skill, if you can at least show again, that curiosity and that ability to take the time to learn it, then that's just, that's just as good often. (laughs) So awesome. I have two more questions if we have time. Sure. Um, we have someone who's asking if you have an example of a resume that like that stood out to you that you prefer, that was like a good, uh, you know, that like caught your eye. Hmm. Um, that's a great question. I mean, I don't have one like right here, right now that I could show you, but there are some specific formatting things that, I mean, again, because we look at resumes all day long, just some good tips. Um, firstly, you don't need to include a picture. You don't need to include too many personal details on there. Um, I also uh, have a little bit of the feeling of like summaries to a certain extent, like if it's super short and concise, it's great, but having like a really long summary on your resume itself is not always is the most helpful because we know you're looking for a job. So, um, so I think that the most important thing is that what context that you give in the descriptions of your experiences. So this again, goes back to the, um, updating your resume for every job you apply for. Um, because I am a big believer that you're probably going to have some type of experience, even if it's not like a traditional, uh, roadmap or traditional way of getting that experience, there's often going to be skills that you learn in other roles or in other uh, projects that you've worked on that can still j- demonstrate the same skill that, that might be called for in a, in a job description. Um, so really tailoring your, your j- resume to match that job description is so important, but you also want to make sure that that's not just like blocks of information, just having so much content on your resume and making it look too busy um, because that that's, that's just gonna, I mean, it, it can hurt our eyes. It can hurt our heads sometimes quite literally. Um, so you want to have like a good balance between white space, but also having information. So I'd say the biggest call out in that regard is just to try to be as concise as possible. So this is another thing that circles back to that star method, right? Like if you can really make it as concise into those four points, um, as well as just including some details, like if there are any quantitative data or quantitative numbers that you can share of like, Hey, I worked on this project and the impact was it it improved productivity by X percent, right? Like those are the types of things that are really great things to share. Um, and just having like a short, um, just maybe three or four at most bullet points per position, um, because you want to give enough information to show you have the experience, but you don't need to give so much that the person feels like they already know everything before you get on the phone. Um, I think it's important to kind of have enough so that the recruiter will be interested of like, Hey, this sounds really cool. I want to learn more about that project. Um, but yeah, those are kind of my thoughts on that. Anything to add there, Betty? Um, I love verbs in the first bullet. Like if it's your current job saying like own as, as a verb, like uh, own 
like hiring pipeline for X amount of roles, for example. And then the other ones being like past tense, it's just very helpful. And then going back from most recent to like going in descending order. So that's really helpful. <laughs> Sometimes you get them flipped and that's always really hard, especially mm -hmm. when you're looking at them all day long. Mm -hmm. um, so keeping that in mind, like, like Amanda said, like know who's reading them. And a lot of the time it's gonna be recruiters who have like five, six, seven roles that they're hiring for. So the more concise it is and the more relevant it is um, and easier to read, I think the better chance you have um, at having a good resume and then moving forward. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I just want to call it, we do have one of these sessions that is just about resumes. And so if, if that's still a question that you have, you know, find it's on our YouTube channel. So find that. Um, and you know, Robin's always happy to help as well, but that's a good starting place, um, to get, you know, more detailed information on resume stuff. Okay. Very last question. And then I'll let you move on. Um, any advice on how to get hands-on experience that companies are expecting from positions that don't include coding? for example, a certified scrum master? Mm. Um, so I know that there's quite a few online courses. Um, sometimes even just doing something as simple as like a LinkedIn course can be a really great way to, to show like, Hey, I have some aptitude in this. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different pro I mean, I'm thinking much more programming perspective. So Betty, I'll let you jump in a little bit more for some of the other positions. Um, but there's a lot of boot camps that you can be a part of. There's a lot of like uh, online open source coding projects. Um, again, LinkedIn courses where you can just go in and show, demonstrate your aptitude with, uh, skills like that. Um, as well as even something like this, right? Like put, being a part of something like tech moms is a great way to show like, Hey, I'm really interested in this field and I'm being proactive to learn more about it. Um, so those are kind of the ones that are initially coming to my mind. Yeah. Quick, um, quick addition. I think in addition to obviously doing the certification and learning on your own time and, and actually searching for that information, um, taking more of a job crafting approach. Um, so let's say you're in a, in a job field that's a little bit more relevant to like a scrum master, for example, or applying a scrum master to a role, um, crafting your job and working with your current manager on focusing on how you can apply that self-taught um, ability in your current role. I think it means small little ways um, just enough so you can start actually applying the things that you're learning um, separate from your regular job. Um, happy to give more information on that if, if the question comes up as well. Job crafting is, is huge in learning new things um, and developing yourself in the direction you want to go and what you're interested in. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I think we're good for now. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, this part of, of, of the interview process is very obviously much more geared towards engineering in particular, I would say. So the technical challenge, it's usually the, the second round in terms of the actual interview process. Um, so this is usually its own interview. Like I mentioned before, it can be in a number of different formats. So it might be a live interview session, kind of like I mentioned before with a, a, a coding room, like a coder pad, where you have somebody, it's often a different member of the engineering team um, asking you a question and collaborating with you and like wanting to see how you work through this problem. Um, or I would say more often than not, I'm seeing a lot more take-home challenges. Um, I'm kind of a big fan of take-home challenges because I think it is um, kind of like... Mikhail, you mentioned before, it's, it's a little bit more of a demonstration of what real life coding is going to be like, because in the real world, if you need to consult a, an article, or if you need to do some research, if you do run into a, a roadblock, then you can do that. And you have the time to do that. Um, all of the managers that I've worked with as well with take home challenges are very open to questions. So even if you're just shooting them an email saying, Hey, I've gotten this far, but I have a question about this. They're willing to ask those questions. Um, and really this technical round, the main goal, of it is to see an actual example of your code um, and see how well in practice you know the languages or the technologies that you say that you know. Um, so again, the, the the challenge itself can really depend on the company and their interview process. But if it's a take-home challenge, uh, there is usually a, a time constraint of some sort. It can be anywhere between one or six hours. I think that also really depends on the level of position that you're interviewing for. Um, so mo more of the challenges that I've seen have been in that kind of two, maybe three hour range. Um, but there's also going to be specific directions. So often this is sent with a specific prompt. So it will give you the data. If, you, if there's data involved, it will say some of the expectations of what we're expecting this code to, to do. And it ideally at the end of the day should run. So compile the information, compile the data, 
again, whatever the expectations listed in that prompt say. Um, but like I mentioned, we want to see how you think through a problem. Um, we want to see if you're thinking outside the box. Are you having creative solutions? You know, how well do you take hints and nudges in the right direction as you're interviewing with this person? Um, and it, as well as asking questions. So really, this is a if it's a take home, it's a great way to see, you know, how your actual work. But if it's live, it's another great example of what is it going to actually be like to work and collaborate with this person. Um, so the big call outs there, again, very common themes. Asking questions is really important. Um, again, if you were in the real world already working with this team and you didn't know something, you'd go ask for help, right? So this is the same environment. You should also um, show what you know, but you also should be willing to take ideas. Um, again, similarly, if, if there's a coding challenge, you can expect it to be whatever language is specifically called in on the job description. So that, like I mentioned before, taking that opportunity to brush up on it, maybe read articles that have been posted about it, or maybe taking some time to go on to GitHub to brush up your, your coding skills um, definitely does not hurt. Um, and then speaking up, especially is this is one of the biggest feedbacks that I've get it, I've gotten of people who fail in technical challenges is because they don't talk while they're doing the work. So especially in live challenges, um, they are thinking through things, which is great. It's also, it's very fine to take time to think through what you're doing, but eventually you do need to, to speak your thoughts, explain what your reasoning is, explain what you're thinking through so that the person that is interviewing you is not left in the dark, right? Um, again, this ties back to that collaboration mentality of, um, this person is just trying to do it all on their own. And I just feel like I'm sitting here watching them, right? Like you really want to, to take the time to share your knowledge and, um, yeah, obviously, like I said, explain your reasoning. Um, but again, so this is much more focused on the, the technical, the R&D backgrounds and those types of positions. Um, so corporate roles will also have a second round interview. Um, I'll let Betty talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, are we jumping into the work sample kind of section? So this is usually more so like the second round, like before the work sample, we'll get into that, that one next. Okay. Um, but yeah, cause I know for my product management roles, we do have second round conversations before we move to it. So it's still overall three steps. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the roles you're working on right now are like that or not, but we, yeah, we typically have another interview in between. Yeah. Very seldom. Um, unless they like want additional feedback or there's like another stakeholder that is relevant to talk to outside of the hiring manager. Um, one of the roles I've seen this in is an accounting role. Um, so we're hiring for a senior accountant, for example, and we wanted to see like their Excel abilities. So that's a, a direct relator to like the technical take home challenge. Like how well can you work through this Excel sheet <laughs> and then talk about it in real time with um, another accountant at the company. So mm -hmm. that's another example. Yeah. So you see it on and I, side too. I think that call out of like another stakeholder is a great, a great mention because yeah, the, the product management roles that I, I mentioned that I hire for, um, we have the first round be a hiring manager screen, but then the second round is a conversation with another member of the team, somebody who you are going to work really closely with. And so it's really important for you to have a chance to also interview and talk with that person. Um, and often in those second round interviews, they'll build upon whatever was discussed in the first round interview, right? So maybe if in the first round, the manager got to ask you a lot of questions about adaptability and like projects that you've worked on that had obstacles that you needed to work around, but they didn't get a chance to ask about your prioritization skills, right? So you could kind of expect in the second round, they'll ask questions that are maybe things that you didn't get a chance to talk about in that first round. But yeah, but then um, if that goes well, then the final round interview, this one, I it's very broad, the information that I included in here, because this one especially really depends on the role that you're interviewing for and the team specifically. Um, but in general, the final round interview, it is kind of like a virtual on-site. So it's a couple hours long. Um, I've typically seen them last anywhere between two and four hours, just depending on how many people they have on that panel. Um, but typically the, the final rounds and how we have them 
set up at Duello is they include three overall steps. So the first part is a presentation. And the presentation, I would say, especially for tech companies, is very common. A lot of companies will ask candidates to create a presentation on a previous project that they've worked on. Um, the amount of material that you need to present, again, can really vary on the company. But here at Duello, we ask people to talk about a project for about 15 minutes. Um, and really, this is, again, star method. <laughs> Just keep coming back to that. Um, but we really want to get an idea of, in practice, how you've worked through a problem. So really only spending the first maybe two or three minutes on the context, like what was this project? But the real meat and potatoes of the presentation should be the problem solving that went on. So what were some of the obstacles and the challenges that you ran into and how did you and your team work through them? Um, really big call out is to make sure you're clear on what your specific role was in solving that problem. That's another big piece of feedback I've gotten with um, presentations that haven't gotten well, gone well, I should say, is that uh, the person talked very generally and just kept saying we just kept saying the team and it was not clear at all what their specific role in that work was. Um, and then of course, in addition to the problem solving, they do also want to hear about the solution and the impact that that work had. Um, and then following the presentation portion itself, there's always going to be question and answer. So whether the presentation takes 30 minutes or an hour long really, again, depends on the company. Um, but the panel is going to consist of pretty much everyone that you're going to talk to in one on one groups after. Um, so they're going to ask all sorts of, of questions. Um, usually the panels will consist of people from across the, the business. Um, so we'll, of course, want to have some pretty big key stakeholders like people you would be working pretty closely with in a day-to-day -day capacity. Um, but here at Duello, for example, we do also like to get in some buy-in from other departments, um, especially to have that overall culture fit and that perspective um, and, and have that buy-in. Um, so yeah, you, you might get questions from somebody who's not an engineer or maybe who's not in the, the team specifically. And so it's also be, it's good to be able to answer some of those questions that are a little bit more general, like collaboration and again, adaptability and that style. Um, as well as the nitty gritty details and the technical capacity that an engineer might ask with those, those uh, examples. Um, and like I mentioned, there's also focus group interviews. So following the presentation, you're going to break out into a number of different uh, interviews. Sometimes they're literally one on one where you're just meeting individually with each person on that panel. Here at Duello, we do usually like two on one. So kind of more group interviews. So we do two focus groups here at Duello. And usually we like to set it up so that the first group is going to be some of those people that are, again, key stakeholders. These are the people that you're going to to work with if you get hired onto this position. So um, right now I'm hiring for a front-end engineer and this person's going to work really closely with our design team and our QA team. So we always like to make sure we get one person from both of those teams to be part of their panel interview. Um, and then the second focus group interview is going to be with, again, some of those, uh, those teammates from other parts of the business. So maybe we would have somebody come in from like our operations team or our um, our revenue team, like just to have that chance to talk a little bit more about the big picture culture. And so both of those focus groups um, essentially are really a chance to get an idea of um, kind of more of the soft skills side of things. Like how well does this person communicate and how, how uh, willing are they to answer some of these questions? Uh, do they stay on topic? Um, do they like to, again, collaborate with others or work really independently? Um, we are really big on collaboration here. So we want people who are going to be really proactive for asking for help and going and learning more about the business. Um, so those are kind of more of the skill sets that are focused on in those breakout interviews. Um, but yeah, so any call outs on the corporate side? They're very similar. Um, so a lot of the, what we do is a chance for you to demonstrate how you would hypothetically approach a situation. So for example, we um, recently you're making a hire for a director of account management and our work sample presentation is really geared towards how would you build out a team for example how would you like reward and train your team so it's walking through like your methodology how you would do something how you would approach something hypothetically um, and then on the more junior side for example we have a, a customer service representative and it's shorter but they talk about you know um, approaches to communication and customers but then also doing a um 
like a role play, for example, where you'll actively do a role play and see how you communicate actively. So it's just an opportunity for you to show your chops, show how you would actually approach and solve problems specific to the position itself. Awesome. And I want to be sensitive to the time, but luckily we only have, I believe it's uh, two, two more slides of actual content. Um, but yeah, the, the really other important part of the process that, you know, if everything goes well and you make it through all of those other stages, um, you're likely to get to the offer process. So if the team wants to, to hire you and have them be, a, you know, have you be a part of their team, then the last part of the process is the offer negotiation round and the offer letter generation. So this is really where, um, um, recruiters will come back in and kind of be your main point of contact. Um, here at Duello, we like to do it a little bit differently where the managers also have a much bigger part of this. You know, they actually call and give the offer to our candidates. Um, so it can be a little bit interchangeable, but recruiters are definitely the ones who are confirming a lot of these details. And they're the ones who actually generate the offer letter itself. Um, so this is where you start to go in and confirm a lot more of the specific details. Like, okay, if you want to take this position, when is your potential start date? Do you need to give notice to to your current company? Um, do you have any upcoming travel or upcoming PTO that might affect a potential start date? Um, this is also where we're going to have a better sense of, especially for technical roles that are more often than not salary positions. Um, so there is ranges for each level. Um, so by this point in the process, we'll have a really good understanding of, okay, this person is maybe a mid-level engineer, but they're really close to being promoted to a senior. So they're kind of at the higher end of that range. So that's where we would confirm their specific salary that we're offering them. Um, we also would be able to go into a lot more detail of hey, here are our benefits and here are all the options that we provide, kind of sending them over the PDF so they can start thinking through which, which option, which coverage level do I want once I come in. Um, this is also the part of the process where we would kick off background checks and reference checks, um, which uh, you know, you're, you're going to need to be able to pass a background check. All offers are usually contingent on a successful background check pass. And usually the background checks are just things to, you know, make sure you are who you say you are, not any like major criminal activity, things like that. Um, obviously at this point, you should have a really good understanding of who you're reporting into, but definitely will be confirmed. And if you have direct reports, you kind of get a better sense of, you know, what does that look like and the team itself. Um, and then you start getting a better expectation as well as upcoming communications that you're going to be getting from, you know, maybe other emails, other teams within the company, as well as documents that you might need to sign. Um, so this is a big, a big area. Are there any questions that have come up? Not about this specifically. And I do want to say that we do have an entire nother session based awesome. on just this alone. Perfect. Again, compensation and salaries <laughs> and negotiations. Awesome. It's a very tricky subject. So we it want is. an entire session on its own. So that is yep. coming up. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, we'll have more content for that soon. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a big part of the process. So yeah, recruiters are definitely really big on this process as well. I mean, it's, it's what we need to do to close somebody and, you know, actually get them started. Um, so yeah, this is really like the finish line work. So it's really important. Um, but yeah, but, um, like I said, I just want to make sure I can have a chance to cover everything. So I just wanted to have a chance just to quickly highlight, um, some tips in terms of reaching out to recruiters. Um, sometimes when you're actively applying for positions, you might not hear back right away. And especially if uh, the teams are, you know, they have a lot of positions that they're hiring for. Sometimes they also will post jobs a little bit in advance just to gain some traction before they actually start interviewing people. So just wanted to give some best practices in terms of reaching out to um, recruiters if you haven't yet been engaged for a role. Um, biggest thing is to definitely do your research. Um, again, kind of some big titles you can look for is anybody who's working as a recruiter or talent acquisition, more often than not, if they have people of some kind listed in their title, that also can be at least recruiting adjacent. So that person might be able to at least get you in contact with the person who will be the recruiter for that role. Um, but you want to find those titles. And then from there, ideally, you want to try to find a little bit more information. So this can be a little bit hit or miss because not all people put all of their details on their LinkedIn page. Um, but you'll want to try to look specifically for um, people working on the teams that you're trying to join, right? So if you're looking for an engineering role, looking for a technical recruiter or R&D, um, looking for somebody who in their description says supporting software engineering or hardware engineering, um, you, you just want to look for those specific keywords. 
Um, once you find those people, you'll then want to send a message to them and you want to try to keep it short and sweet. Um, obviously try to highlight the role, the specific reason why you're reaching out, or if you're open to just general opportunities in a specific space, you know, mentioning that, um, but also including a brief little, maybe a sentence on why that interests you. So if you're really interested in working for a specific company, say, Hey, you know, I, I see that you guys are hiring and I'm really passionate about the work that you're doing in this space. I'd love to have an opportunity to explore opportunities. Um, and something that I think is a really great call out to, to differentiate your message compared to, to other people is to ask a question. Um, I get a lot of people who will send me connection requests and like reach out to me on things like LinkedIn. Um, but for me, I always get a little bit more engaged when they ask a specific question that's tied, tied to it. So showing that they want to learn more. And I think it's a better way to kind of uh, get a response for somebody because again, uh, recruiters are really, they're trying to keep in mind company image. They're also trying to make sure candidates have a good experience. So when you ask a question, it kind of puts a little bit of that priority of like, hey, I really want to learn more about this. Can you give me some more information? And so I think it's a really great way to kind of light a fire to, to get a response. Um, but then, yeah, if you do connect with somebody, you talk to somebody, I also would say it's a really great practice to send them a LinkedIn uh, connection request. Um, cause it's just a really great way to network and you never know, like, even if you don't get a position, something else might become available, might be shared. And so it's always just good practice to connect with the people you talk to, but that's it. Any final questions? Um, we are over time, so I'm just going <laughs> to let it go. Um, okay. I really, really appreciate both of you coming so much good information and I'm over here taking notes and I'm not even looking for a job right now, but I think, um, super valuable. Like I said, we have this recorded, we will put it on the, on our, uh, YouTube page. So you can go back and watch it again. Cause there was so, so much good stuff in here. Um, and again, thank you so much. And, um, I think everyone who's on this call or seeing this should connect with Betty and Amanda on LinkedIn. Um, including me. I'm going to go do that right now. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I'd love that. Um, thank you so much. And we'll uh, talk to you later. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Bye. I'm checking with Skylar to see if he's going to end our recording. I think, I think you guys are probably good to hop and I can, I'll coordinate with Skylar from here and out. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much again. Thanks, Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Good night.